Timothy. Paul's first letter to Timothy. And turn to chapter 6. First Timothy chapter 6, we're going to read verses 3 through 10. Our focus this evening will be verse 6. If you would please stand with me. Let's give our hearts and minds to hearing our blessed God. Chapter 6, verse 3. And this is the word of God. If any man... Teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness. He is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness. From such withdraw thyself. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain that we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us therewith, let us be therewith content. But they that will be rich, fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which, while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Amen. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Holy Father, thy people stand before thee. We know that people have gathered various places throughout the world. We pray for all of thy children everywhere, any time they meet, any, any day that they meet. May we know thy presence in these days. May we know the light of Christ, the light of the world. Come, O Holy Spirit. Come. And give us understanding of these blessed words which thou did breathe. Breathe upon our souls. Draw nigh to us, for we draw nigh unto thee. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. As Paul neared the conclusion of his first letter to Timothy, he gave his son in the faith some final exhortations. Inspired by the Holy Spirit, Paul describes the words of our Lord Jesus Christ as wholesome words. That means healthy words. Jesus' words and his doctrine promote godly living. Let me say that again. Christ's words promote godly living. This is not just a nice religious book that has some wonderful ideas and principles that we can sit down and get a little encouragement from once in a while. This is a book to which we must react <clears throat> and those healthy words of Christ are part of that glorious purpose of God in leading us to godly living Jesus himself taught this during his earthly ministry our Savior said the words that I speak unto you they are spirit and they are life Paul knew 
that Christ's words, empowered by Christ's spirit, produced godliness in Christ's people. The church of Jesus Christ at Ephesus had once embraced Christ's life-giving words, but false teaching had disrupted and corrupted the biblical order in Christ's church. Falsity from the pulpit, falsity in our minds and in our flesh will lead us away from the order God wants us to walk in. It's that simple. We're either hearing the words of God and abiding in them, or we're hearing the words of the flesh and the devil that will guide us into something else. And there's no one more religious in this world than Satan. He understands the power of religion. While he delights, no doubt, in drawing human beings, the image bearers of God, into every filthy and grotesque and abominable perversion known to man, he gets the most mileage out of false doctrine. Christ's words are healthy. We need them. We need his wonderful word. <clears throat> Our blessed Lord Jesus said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Paul knew that Christ's words, empowered by Christ's spirit, produced godliness in Christ's people. That's why there are pastors and elders and teachers. False teaching did at that time, and false teaching always does disrupt God's biblical order in his churches. For this reason, Paul described the character of the false teachers and the consequences of their perverted doctrine. They would not submit to Christ's wholesome words. Therefore, Paul declared that the false teachers were arrogant, ignorant, and unhealthy in their craving of controversy. And that, that craving spawned envy, Quarrels, abusive speech, suspicion, and constant arguing. Paul said that their minds were depraved and deprived of the truth. Their minds were so corrupt and perverse that they believed godliness was just a way to make a profit. If you surf the internet to watch internet religion... It used to just be car, radio, or television. Now it's all over the internet, everywhere. There's false doctrine everywhere you turn. I thank the Lord for the truth that's being preached. And I'm thankful for the many men whose sermons go out and preach the, the truth of Christ all around the world without leaving where they are. But it is quite obvious that we still live in a day where people can be so easily drawn into false doctrine. I mentioned previously, but I, I mention it again just because I remain stunned at the number. In one evangelical poll that was taken recently, 79% of the evangelicals said that Jesus was just a created person. Now, what does that tell you about what's going on in their pulpits and or their own hearts? Brethren, that's a staggering number. I don't know if it's true. Who knows nowadays what polls are really accurate and what, what they're not which ones are not. But the fact of the matter is, I mean, this was coming from uh, a conservative source. So <clears throat> uh, over 50% did not believe that Jesus is the living God come in the flesh. 
That's direct opposition to John's first letter. Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? And my brethren, false doctrine is always with us. And we must always give ourselves to the pure word of God, studying, praying, crying out to the Lord, hearing sound and faithful preaching, and taking it in. Not just grading it. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> Paul exposed the root of the false uh, teacher's problem, and it was simple, greed. Greed. It is no surprise then that the apostle exhorted the Ephesians to withdraw from them. Greed is idolatry. But Paul gave them a remedy for the plague of false doctrine. He gave them a, re a remedy <laughs> for the ungodly living manifested by the false teachers and their followers. And what is it? Godliness with contentment. Godliness with contentment. And that is the title of our message. Though may our gracious Heavenly Father grant us eyes to see, ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to this church. And may the Lord Jesus Christ be exalted in it all. <clears throat> so our first thought is this, contentment versus greed. Contentment versus greed. We live in a consumer society. And if you've watched any of the documentaries made on how we became that, uh, they are quite astonishing. <clears throat> we used to be a country that bought what it needed but we have been brilliantly and psychologically moved into a country that just buys what it wants because its, it's identity and its happiness is in its stuff. As we've said, Paul exposed the core issue of the false teachers. It was greed. Uh, they were then... Because of that, idolaters, covetousness, the word of God tells us, is idolatry. You don't have to bow down before a golden statue. You just have to live for your paycheck. You just have to live for the next thing you've got to have to be happy. To be wonderful, to be acceptable, to be cool, to be admired, to be respected. Whatever it is. It's no different than bowing down. To wooden stocks or gold and silver gods with a small g. The false teachers had erred from the faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. Because greed governed them, not the Holy Spirit. They had not submitted themselves to Christ's words. Because they lived for money, not for Jesus Christ. They could delude themselves into believing that gain is godliness. That could mean one of two things. One, they believed that earthly possessions were the proof that God was blessing them. That would be similar to the health and wealth gospel that's out there today. The name it and claim it error of our day. Or number two, on the other hand, that the Greek can be understood to mean that godliness was their means of making a profit. P-R-O-F-I-T. Which means they apparently believed that people should pay them and pay them well for their teaching. Now the Lord tells us we're to take care of those who break the bread of life to us, who preach the word of God to us, who guide us in the way. But there's a difference for those who are being sustained for doing so and those who are getting fabulously wealthy. Amen. 
So these men were in the religion for profit business. And it's, it's with us today. It's everywhere around us. But whichever of those two views is correct, such thinking proved that their minds were depraved and deprived of Christ's truth. His truth wasn't their treasure. His truth wasn't what satisfied their souls. His truth, our Christ, and all that he is, and all that he has taught us, that isn't, was the love of their life. That was not the love of their life. And because of that, they were ungodly. Ungodly. That's the worst thing you can be. People might call you names, might call you four-letter words, might do all kinds of things to put you down, but the worst thing you can be is ungodly because you were made in the image of God and were to be His representative in this world. The false teachers were ungodly their doctrine was ungodly, and it was producing ungodliness in the church at Ephesus. A church that had been founded on the great teaching of the gospel of Christ. Well, Paul did not want Timothy to live that way. But he said, Godliness with contentment is great gain. The little word that begins that sentence, but sets up the contrast. They're ungodly. But godliness with contentment is the great gain. <clears throat> the word but set Paul apart, it would set Timothy apart, and it will set us apart if we believe that godliness with contentment is great gain. So, what is godliness? It's a good word. Godliness was a crucial theme for Paul. He used it often in his writings. The Greek word translated godliness appears 15 times in the New Testament. Yet eight of those uses are right in this letter, 1 Timothy. It gives you something of the pressure that Paul was feeling regarding this church and it's going off the tracks. False doctrine never produces holiness. It is not possible. It cannot be because it's not the truth. We are to walk in Christ, in Him, the way, the truth, and the life. God is the truth. The Spirit of God who gave us the Word tells us that Christ is the, the truth. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of truth. The Bible is the Word of truth. The church is the pillar and ground of the truth. We are to be a people of truth. Amen. And that means we've got to soak and saturate our minds and hearts in truth or we will be overcome by the lies of the world, the flesh, and the devil. Your flesh will do everything it can to convince you that certain civil, uh, sinful activities are just your liberty. Get away from all those old legalists. You feel good when you do this, just keep doing it. How would you know unless you are filled with God's truth? Your flesh will lie to you in a moment. The scriptures will not. <clears throat> Godliness for Paul was not merely a hidden inequality. He saw godliness as the reverent life lived in devotion to God. 
As one writer puts it, godliness meant being totally consecrated to God, to his worship, and to the fulfillment of his will. He goes on to say that godliness is an extreme devotion to accomplish the divine will. Now, there's a place to be extreme. <laughs> we can get called extreme for a lot of reasons. But I think it is wonderful to think of our lives as extreme devotion to accomplish the divine will. To walk in this world with our energy, with the power of God's spirit, with the light of God's word, with the blessing of Christ Jesus to live a life that matters in advancing the kingdom and the will of God. Did not Christ teach us to pray? Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. That's what we should be thinking. Well, how does he do that? He uses his people. He shows forth his glorious and amazing grace, saving sinners and then putting them on the path. Oh, they stumble. They fall. They fall flat on their faces and they get up. Why? Because they have a savior. Because his blood cleanses us. Because his grace picks us up and sets us back in the path. They go because his love motivates them. An extreme devotion to accomplish the divine will. Biblically speaking, then, godliness is about the way we live. <clears throat> that our lives show forth that we are children of God, born of God, filled with the Spirit of God, believing the words of God. That whatever we do, whether... <laughs> Whatever our work is, whether we are man or woman, whatever we are, we glorify God with what he has made us. A life of godliness tells the world that we've been born of God's spirit. It tells the world that we have repented of our former sins and way of life. It tells the world that we indeed believe that Jesus Christ died on Calvary's cross to save us from our sins, and that he did. It tells us, and it tells the world, that Christ came into the world to save such as we. Amen. Godliness is truly profitable because it speaks to the world about the glorious Savior, the eternal Son who became flesh to save us from our sins. Godliness is truly profitable. It benefits our souls as we communicate with God in prayer, in His Word, in meditation, in repentance, in faith, in loving obedience, in the corporate worship of God, and in fellowship with his people. And we could go on. But you see, if we don't think those are benefits, we'll be looking for something else. We'll be looking for something that will get the flesh fired up. And it's all around you. You don't even have to look for it. You'll bump into it sooner or later. But if Christ is your treasure, if that is the gold and silver and all the jewels of life for you, you won't be easily drawn away. Godliness not only glorifies God and edifies his people in this world, it turns our eyes, it turns our hearts, our affections, toward and assures us of the glory of the world to come. We are not, uh, we are not here to live for the world. We are here to love the world in one sense, to love the immortal souls of the lost and to tell them of Christ. We should love them to tell them of the Savior. 
We don't want to love the world as John forbids. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Now that's what will have your attention if Christ does not. So, <clears throat> godliness in this world declares that we are glory bound and on our way to eternal unbroken fellowship with Christ and with his people forever. Godliness begins with God's eternal purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. That's the goal, and it's easy to forget. We get caught up in the things around us. We get caught up in the things that we can see rather than being caught up in those things which we can't see. Paul says, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, that he didn't lose heart because he was looking at the things that were not seen. We know what's constantly trying to get our attention, right? <laughs> Everything that's around us. Everything around that would draw us away, pull us down, break our hearts, or tickle our fancies. But godliness begins in that glorious eternal purpose where God has determined to make every one of his children like Christ the Son. To be conformed to the image of his son. That he might be the firstborn among many brethren. God's eternal purpose then was to make his people like Christ. Who is the model of godliness. Jesus is the model of godliness. When we're not clear on what it is. Read Matthew. Read Mark. Read Luke. Read John. God makes us like Christ in two ways. One, God declares his people righteous. Now that's good news. If you know anything about yourself, the fact that the judge of heaven could declare you righteous is astonishing beyond your comprehension. Number two, God makes his people righteous. He declares us righteous, and he makes us righteous. First, the eternal Son of God became truly human, a truly human man. He did this so that he could suffer death as the sin-bearing substitute for his people. Jesus, the God-man, suffered. He bled. He died upon Golgotha in unspeakable agony and on the third day God the Father manifested his almighty and miraculous power raising him from the dead he manifested his almighty power to raise Jesus up from the dead now let's be clear <clears throat> Christ was godly he lived a life of perfect and holy devotion to his heavenly father and he lived it in the place of his people he was their substitute. He is our substitute. He did what we could not do or did not do. He obeyed the law. The Roman soldiers spit on him and beat him and crucified him. Why? Why? God was punishing Jesus in the place of his people. By this, Jesus satisfied the demands of God's law. He did this as the representative of his people. Therefore, by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, his death, his resurrection, God declares believers righteous. As righteous as Christ. Because it's his righteousness that's imputed to us. This is a legal righteousness. It comes by faith alone in Christ. And this is the motivation for our godliness. 
We didn't buy it. We didn't earn it. There's no merit for us in it. It is the gift of God. And we lay hold of it by faith. And the judge declares us righteous. All because of the works of Christ. <laughs> we can put it this way. We are saved by works. But none of ours. Right. All of his. Amen. So. <clears throat> God makes us righteous. Uh, declares us righteous by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We're a forgiven people. Declared righteous. And when we fail, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Now, truly, that kindles the fire in our hearts of love for him. That, that cranks up the love for him. He's declared us righteous. You know that you're not. But we believe that we are because of Christ. And what he's done. Secondly, God makes his people righteous. We're not only declared righteous. I think each of us would just be delighted beyond words to know if there were nothing else about us that God, the, the eternal judge, has said, you're righteous. But God goes further. God begins his work of making us godly by the miracle that we call the new birth. Jesus said, verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. In this new birth, the Holy Spirit gives a sinner a new heart. He breathes new life in the heart of one who was dead in trespasses and sins. This means that the Holy Spirit produces a new principle of life, spiritual life, power, and understanding in a sinner, an undeserving sinner. Oh, John could write, We know that the Son of God has come and hath, and hath given us an understanding. That's the only reason you're a Christian. That's right. God gave you an understanding. You saw what you were. Why did you finally see what you were? Why did you begin to feel the sting of sin? The very fact that you were foul before God. The fact that you deserved to be crushed, broken, cast into hell. Left forever in the flames of misery. Why would you believe that a man that died the death of a criminal 2,000 years ago could have anything to do with you living forever? Everything has everything, everything to do with it. He's given us an understanding that he is the God man who came and died and rose again for us. John could go on to say <clears throat> that he's given us that understanding that we may know him that is true and that we are in him that is true, even in his son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. The spirit changes the way a sinner thinks about God. He changes the way that he thinks about his sin or her sin. He changes the way that he thinks about righteousness. Because of that, the sinner sees himself as lost. He sees his eternal need. All of a sudden, he understands, she believes that they have a need for Jesus Christ. Amen. They see that he is altogether desirable. They see that he is altogether lovely. And they understand that he's willing to save them. They understand that and they believe him. The Holy Spirit now lives in that believer. <laughs> And he repents of his sins and he believes on the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's not just a one-time formula thing. Well, I believed once. You start a life of believing and you believe to the end of your life. Amen. And you repent at the beginning and you're repenting at the end. It is a life of awareness of God, awareness of holiness, purity, Righteousness, 
and the reality of our remaining sin. Hallelujah. What a Savior. He saves us completely. He's interceding for us now. We will finish the course. If we're born of God's Spirit, we will finish this course because He's make he's declared us righteous and he's making us righteous we will finish the course because he's interceding for us he knows the plan the plan is for all of us to be like him glory to god i won't just be a slightly better version of me in heaven i will be like christ and so will you that is wonderful news This is life empowered by the Holy Spirit, shaped by the Bible. The life produced by the indwelling Spirit is a life from heaven, by heaven, for heaven. It is a life conforming to God's character and God's will. This is what God does in us. In Christ, it is what He has done for us to save us from our sins. And then he begins that work in us, in sanctification. This life manifests itself. You can see it. It manifests itself by faith in Christ, communion with Christ, obedience to Christ, Fellowship with Christ's people and the worship of Christ by the power of the Spirit. God was looking for us to worship Him in spirit and in truth. That's godliness. It's a motive for godliness, is it not, to know that God will not stop till He's finished with the work. He that hath begun a good work in you will continue it until the day. It is a life that God is working in the heart of every new creature. In other words, by the power of the Holy Spirit, the believer consents to, agrees with the wholesome words of the Lord Jesus Christ, which the false teachers were not doing. And that is why their doctrine made no one holy. Might have made him feel good. It might have made people feel good all about themselves. But the word of God, when it pierces our hearts, shows our sins, and then turns our eyes to the Savior. And we can praise him all our days. Well, now, with this in mind, let's consider contentment. Let's consider contentment. We've got some idea of what godliness is, I hope. But Paul says godliness with contentment is great gain. Quite obvious, the false teachers were not content with Paul's idea of godliness. They were more content with the money they got from whatever it was they were preaching. The English word contentment comes from a Greek word that means, in this context, the state of being happy or satisfied with whatever God brings into your life. Mm. We sing that wonderful hymn, and some of us don't truly love it until the Lord brings some suffering into our lives. Whate'er my God ordains is right oh it's nice to sing it's a beautiful melody the melody is completely appropriate for the wonderful uh, biblical lyrics that are there it tells us about our sovereign God <clears throat> but when the afflictions come when the difficulties come when the heartaches come when the gut-wrenching anguish comes it's hard to say this is right and I embrace it because this is what God is doing in my life. That's hard. 
But he's given us an understanding and he's given us his spirit. He's given us his word to tell us behind those dark clouds, I'm the one doing things. Keep looking to me. Keep looking to the things that are not seen. And you won't lose heart. Because what you can see very often can bring you as low as you can get. <clears throat> Contentment really is just a state of being satisfied and happy with what's happening. Now we... We see this in the words of, of John the Baptist. After 400 long years without a prophet, the people of Israel faced the ministry of John the Baptist. He came from the wilderness, thundering about repentance. Uh, he, <clears throat> he thundered about the, the baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and he, and he spoke about the day of judgment. He was fiery. And he spoke of fire to come both good and bad. He commanded them to live in a way that was in harmony with repentance. That's what he told everybody. Do works that are meet for repentance. In other words, live a life that's going in the other direction from where you were going. That's the idea. Repentance is a turning. It is a turning from and it is a turning to. It is a turning from sin. It is a turning to Christ. Now, moved by this, the people ask him what the, how they were supposed to live. All right, what, what do you want, John? We hear you out here. You're out here eating locusts and honey, and um, you're kind of an Elijah sort. You're standing out in the water and calling all of us to come into that water, confessing our sins. Now, that had to be a spectacle. We read it, and I don't know how much we think about it. <laughs> Somebody got out here on the beach and stood out in the water and started telling everybody to repent of their sins and come out in the water and be baptized. We'd wonder what was going on. Certainly the people in John's day were, were curious. Are you the Christ? Who are you? Who are you to do this? He said, I'm just a voice crying in the wilderness. But the people came and said, how are we supposed to live? He, he replied, do violence to no man. These were soldiers that had asked him. He says, do violence to no man, neither accuse any falsely, and be content with your wages. Be satisfied. With... Now, why did he say that? Why did he say that? Well, like the tax collector, the soldier could use his position to enrich himself. By threatening or blackmailing people. They didn't make a lot of money. But they could sure petrify people into forking some over. And he's saying, no, don't live that way. Be content with what you earn and go on with that. Well, just, to a certain degree, this is exactly what we're talking about. Be completely content with what God is doing in your life. It doesn't mean, okay, I'm miserable right now. I'll just stay miserable as, as long as you want me to. It's perfectly all right to say, help. But the fact is, regardless of what's happening, that person that's giving you trouble at work, that family member that is driving you wild, that... Uh, that uh, uh, gossip that's going around about you, that person that's assassinating your character, that, I mean, whatever it is you can come up with, that person that hurt me. Eh. Do you really believe God's behind that? Can you be content that if that's what he has purposed, that you can be content with that? Can you look in the mirror and ask? Brethren, Christianity is something real. It's not religious playtime. It's real. And it's under a cross. If any man will follow after me, let him take up his cross. Let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. Christianity is a great way of living by dying. 
But the point that I'm trying to drive home, I hope you're, you're, you're getting at least part of it, is the idea of being content with what your heavenly father is doing. Why should I be content with that? Because he's making you like Christ. He's showing you that you're not patient. He's showing you what you are. He's showing you how oh, someone's opinion of you really matters. We're being made like Christ. God is involved in the most extraordinary project imaginable. He's taking God-hating sinners and making them like Jesus. Thank you, Lord. So, what a contrast we find with the Apostle Paul. He wrote from prison, I have learned. What, is it? what does it mean when you say I've learned? It means you didn't know, right? <laughs> and then you learned. You were instructed. He said, I've learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Written from a prison. Prisons back then were not air-conditioned gyms. They weren't getting three meals a day. They were horrifying. As I was walking down from my house to the building, my next door neighbor has about a a four between a four and five inch rat dead in front of the house. And his tail was about that long. That that's a big rodent. Well for me it is. Uh-uh. Those are the kind of creatures that inhabited the jails. Sometimes they'd be fighting you for your food. Paul writes from a stinking hole somewhere. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. He writes and says, I've learned to be content. And you know why? Jesus said, I'm going to tell you how much you're going to suffer to serve me. Do you believe this book? Do you really believe this book? It's important for us because it's the truth. Let's push this just a little bit further. The first thing to notice here is that Paul learned to be content. He didn't start out a contented fellow. And that's probably true for all of us. But that's why the Lord is very pleased to send sometimes very difficult things. Now, that doesn't mean when difficult things come, that we just have to lie down in the street and let it run over us. I'm not saying that, but I am saying when you understand uh, I'm in this situation and I don't know that I can fix this. Then we say, you've brought this, Lord, show me what you want me to do. How do you want me to handle this? How should I live in front of you now? You're obviously behind this great sorrow or this great sadness. By nature, human beings are anything but content. True contentment does not come to us naturally. Matthew Henry put it this way, quote, We have here an account of Paul's learning, not that which he got at the feet of Gamaliel, but that which he got at the feet of Christ. Close quote. It's Christ that teaches you how to suffer. It's Christ that teaches you how to be afflicted. It's Christ that teaches you how to take those blows that seem to come out of nowhere sometimes. By nature, Paul was like any other human being. He was discontent when things did not go his way. Yet he learned at the feet of Christ to be satisfied. In our remaining time, I want to consider two things. How? How did Paul learn to deal with these things this way. Number one, true contentment comes by believing the biblical testimony that God is sovereign. True contentment comes by believing the biblical testimony that God is sovereign. The word of God boldly declares, but our God 
is in the heavens. He hath done whatsoever he hath pleased. Likewise, the psalmist declares, whatsoever the Lord pleased, that did he in heaven and in earth and in the seas and in all deep places. King Nebuchadnezzar learned this. He testified he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven. That's the proper posture. It's his will. He's doing what he will. We want to do what we will. When you're converted, you understand that he does what he will. And we learn to praise him for it. And we're thankful the more we learn from him, that he didn't put us in charge. True contentment comes by believing that the, believing that the biblical testimony that God is sovereign. King Nebuchadnezzar learned it out there on his hands and knees, eating grass like an animal. <clears throat> God declared through Isaiah, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. And Paul had learned this. Now that's, and we're all in school. We're all, all of us here are in the Lord's school. Are you learning this? Are you learning to praise him? Are you learning in your sorrows, in the difficulties, in the challenges, with enemies, with discovering your own sinfulness, finding out that you're your own worst enemy? Do we praise him for that? We should. Because it'll throw us right back on Jesus. The whole purpose is to be like Jesus. And the Lord will knock us down if he needs to. If he needs to. Now for that reason he could say to the Ephesians. God worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. He's doing it now. He's doing it tonight. If we all wake up tomorrow and have another day. He did that. And we will walk with whatever he does. And there may come great sorrow. Or there may come the greatest joys. It's in his hands. But the more we fellowship with him. The more we pray. The more we commune with him. The more readily we can receive the things that come from his hand. This is life eternal. That they might know thee. The one true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. We must settle it in our minds, brethren. I urge you as I stand here before you tonight. You and I need to settle it. Either we believe that God rules in all things or we do not. There's not any middle ground on that. He sends the blessed times. He sends trials. He sends times of joy. He sends heartaches. He sends triumphs. He sends defeat. Settle it now, dear people of God. Do not leave this meeting without reckoning in your mind. I either just heard the truth or I've been lied to. And if I've heard the truth, how am I doing walking in it? God rules all things. The trials you face, the burdens you bear, the diseases you endure, the pleasures you enjoy, the blessings that you receive, and the happiness that you experience, it all comes from God's hand. Which is it? True godliness grasps that fact by faith. If you're godly, you've, you've laid a hold of the God who rules all things. And it should motivate you. Well. <clears throat> there's more to say on that. But we're almost out of time. Let me get to my last thought. True contentment. True contentment. Not only comes by believing that God is absolutely sovereign. But it comes by believing the biblical testimony of the person and work of Jesus Christ. Our beloved Redeemer said, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So all of us need to answer the question tonight. Where's my heart? Where's 
my heart. What's the treasure of my heart? Brother Randy did a wonderful message sometime back on who has your heart. I'm asking essentially the same question because it's Jesus is telling us where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Your treasure is either seated at the Father's right hand or it's unfortunately wandered to something else. We are made in the image of God, as I have said. Therefore, our desires are rooted in a deep soul hunger. Addictions. Addictions are our attempt to feed that black hole within us. I've got to have something that makes me feel better about this life. When I'm high, I'm okay, right? Or if I'm drinking or if I'm injecting or if I'm just taking or whatever. It might be immorality. might be pornography. Oh, well, you just go right to what it is that's giving your life that bang that you think you need. Or it's the living God. It's Christ. Where's your treasure? You need to know the truth about the Lord Jesus Christ so that you can see that there's no one else like him. He is absolutely, gloriously unique. The God-man. We try to satisfy the craving in our soul with money or with power or with relationships, but all these will pass. They're passing right now. Go find a picture of yourself from 10 years ago. And take a look and see if that's still the same person. Oh, you see some changes. You'll see some changes. Jesus said, lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. Well, where, what treasure is it in heaven? <laughs> it's the Lord Jesus. There's, there's a, a three-word sentence that is the remedy for every sorrow, every challenge, every burden, every heartache in your life. I have Christ. Or maybe your treasure is in another place. I hope it's not. Because he's glorious. I have the Savior. And sometimes our greatest joys come out of those sorrows that he's brought. Because we turn to him. We cast ourselves entirely upon them. And he rescues us again. And we rejoice. Lay up for yourselves. Treasures in heaven. Well, the greatest contentment in human experience is to know on the, that is to know that Christ lifts us up, sets us on the solid rock. There's nothing greater to know than that you're right with God. And not just a forgiven sinner, but a child of God, blessed of God, with this entire universe. It's ultimately our inheritance. It's going to be made new. It's going to be glorious. We're going to rule it with Christ. Do you believe that? When things get difficult, it's hard for me to do that. When things come, it's like all I can see is that thing in front of me that I've got to deal with. Until I get back into the Word and get back to the treasure and realize I have Christ. I have Christ. I have Christ. There's no greater satisfaction. There's no greater contentment than to know that God has loved us before the foundation of the world in Christ. He has purposed our eternal happiness in Christ. And did God plan to save his people before the creation of the world? Now, I want you to think with me. I, I do. I, I want you to at least mentally answer <laughs> <clears throat> did, did God plan to save his people from the creation of the world? 
Yes. Before the creation of the world. Yes. Uh, did the eternal son of God, did the creator of the universe become a man? Yes. Did God take that man and nail him to the cross of Calvary to save his people from their sins? And did the blood of Jesus Christ cleanse them from every sin? Yes. That's what this book tells us. Did God raise him from the dead on the third day for your justification and for your own resurrection? Yes. By this, did God pay the entire debt of sin that his people owed him? Yes. Did God inspire and preserve his word to inform his people of his love in Christ? Yes. The news will be different tomorrow, but the Bible will tell you the same thing it's telling you today. Did God inspire his word? Yes. That we might know that glorious love. Does God grant repentance and faith to every one of his people? Yes. Yes. Does he give his spirit as a gift to his people? Yes. Does he give his Holy Spirit so that they will endure to the very end? Yes. Will they endure even though Satan wars against them, their enemies hate them, trials afflict them, diseases weaken them, and death takes them? Yes. Does he promise never to leave nor forsake his people? Yes. Will his people rule and reign with him for all eternity? Yes. No matter what happens in this life, I repeat, no matter what happens in this life, our answer should be yes, yes, yes. If that's true, those are true riches. And it's all in Christ. Every bit of it. Whatever falls into your life or whatever joys and thanksgivings and, and holy pleasures fall into your life, it's all because of Christ. And that's where your treasure is and that's where your heart ought to be. Godliness with contentment. If we have that treasure, we can be content in any situation, as his people have proven throughout the ages. So let us all settle it in our minds this evening. I urge you with all my heart. O oh, beloved children of God, you believe this or you do not. You say, I'm weak. Mm -hmm. Good. You need to know that. Now he's strong. I don't know if I can do it. You can't do it yourself. But that's why he's giving you Christ, his word, his spirit, his people. He's given you everything you need to walk with him every day. Settle our minds, O oh God. <laughs> you believe this, my friends, or you do not. May we, by the grace of God, through faith in Christ, believe and live in the truth that godliness with contentment is great gain. Amen. Father, we thank thee for thy mercies to us. For how great and glorious they are. Oh, what treasures we have in Christ. Help us never to trade them for the trinkets and the trash of this world. Help us ever to be looking to that Holy One at thy right hand. Help us ever to be delighting in him that loved us and gave himself for us and who will never leave nor forsake us. Now bless thy people. Bless them. May they rest in these truths and walk with thee whatever thou dost bring. We pray it all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Please stand with me. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Let's go in the name of Jesus.